Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, perhaps if you'd have just asked me, Sarah, are you mad? I could have told you straight out <laughs> in 2004. Um, usually takes people about 30 seconds to ask me that question. But um, I'm delighted to be back here today, not least because I feel that Oxford is my sort of spiritual home, second only to the ocean. Um, God only knows why, because I mean, I've been brought up in Rutland, which is completely landlocked, and Oxford is about as far from the sea as you can get as well. But very happy to be back here, not least because after my um, return in 2008 to, to share my sort of tale of I'm about to go out on the ocean, it's quite nice to come back and show people actually that I, I did survive. Not just that I made it, but I, I survived, because um, there are a few times when that wasn't a certainty. So I'm going to share with you the ocean tales tonight, the whys and the wherefores, some of the exciting, scary stories as well, and uh, hope to take you on a bit of an, a bit of an adventure. So this is where I started to row at Oxford. I came here to do a degree in biology. Biology with rowing, I think, would have been more appropriate. If they'd done a sort of a double honours, that would have suited me quite nicely. But um, Oxford taught me to row and channeled all that crazy energy into some, some good boats. So I'm very excited that one of my rowing coaches is here tonight and some ex-crew members are as well. So thank you, Oxford, for teaching me how to row. And uh, it was actually whilst I was at Oxford supposedly writing an essay one night, that an email popped into my inbox and it said, ocean rowing races. And I'm the sort of person that sees an email like that and just thinks, wow, that's better than torpids. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just started looking into all of this and decided actually those were two of my favorite things, oceans and rowing. And if I could put the two together, that would make one hell of an adventure. And it was at the time that Ben, uh, ben Fogel and James Cracknell were out on the Atlantic rowing starkers and telling the world how much they loved it. Um, that this all came to light and so started researching it all and decided that the Indian Ocean would be quite an exciting place to go because the Atlantic, everyone's done the Atlantic, whereas only about three men had successfully made it across the Indian. Um, there'd been quite a few failed attempts. They all survived, don't worry, no one died, but uh, no woman had tried it. And so I thought, ah, oh, this is that's what I want to do. The Indian Ocean, I'll take a crew, because I'd never been in a single boat. I'd always had seven other people in the boat with me. And uh, I sent emails around all my friends and family saying, do you want to come on an ocean rowing trip? And uh, that's pretty much the response. It was a resounding no, you know, on all fronts. No, no. OK, I get the picture. I'm going solo, perhaps. Um, and I thought, OK, university, there must be some other nutters within Oxford. And a few started coming out of the woodwork, so that was good. Looked like I might get a team. And um, then everything changed. Uh, my father died very suddenly, just before I was due to race at Henley in, in June 2006. Exams just around the corner, and everything's sort of thrown in the air. Your whole life turns upside down. It certainly was for me. And I decided fairly early on, I mean, I announced it at his funeral, reading his eulogy, that actually I would row across the Indian still, but I'd go solo, and in his memory, raising lots of money for charity. Now, my father had suffered from rheumatoid arthritis for all of my life up to that point. I was 21, and all I remember is my big, strong, lovely, dependable dad being just debilitated with this horrid, cruel disease. And so the charity choice was easy. Um, arthritis research campaign for the first two years. College was great in supporting me with all of that. And uh, arthritis care this year. And so, really, that's one of my favourite triumphs with the row. Yes, I survived the ocean, but we raised a, a lot of money for charity too. So that's the whys and the wherefores. Adventure and my dad. My kind of commitment to life through that crazy grief. <laughs> We're just going to talk a little bit about the training and preparation of an ocean row because actually that was about 90% of the challenge was just uh, getting to the start line. Being a student, having never rowed on anything more exciting than the ISIS, you know, <laughs> I've never been to sea by myself in a small boat, certainly having no money, um, it was quite a big challenge getting together sponsors and, and people and first of all finding out how you row across an ocean and all the training and things as well. So I had an amazing adventure along the way, but it was uh, one heck of a challenge. And so this, this slide here, I just want you to keep that phrase in your mind as we go through the next few slides. Finals is nothing. Prepare for an ocean row. It's much harder. The ocean's just the nice bit at the end of it all. So I should introduce you to the other half of my team. I've somehow 
got together enough money to, to build a boat. This is Serendipity, Dippers for short. And she's, I think, a rather pretty little boat. She's six metres long. So we put that in sort of real, real terms. We go one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I must add that actually the deck space is only about one and a half steps. So out at sea, you only get one and a half steps. But um, left-hand side of the boat is the cabin. The middle bit is where all the sort of blood, sweat and tears happens. That's the rowing deck. And then the far cabin there is where you store everything. Now she's designed so that if she turns over, she will pop back round again and self-right, which is um, always comforting. Um, and you, you have to take everything with you out onto the ocean. There's nowhere to stop, certainly no one to come and deliver your pizza. And so everything has to come with you. And you've got to be entirely self-supporting with all the kit and food that you take with you. Now, in terms of food, uh, you can come and have a look at this afterwards. Rather uninspiring rabbit food, I think they call it. Um, dehydrated, that sort of thing. And uh, my favourite addition to the, the sort of the, the, the larder was 500 bars of chocolate. <laughs> And I can say, well, firstly, that I'm very sad about the Cadbury craft bid, but um, <laughs> secondly, secondly, that 500 bars actually isn't enough for the ocean. Not for a girl when she's by herself, anyway. Um, I'd eaten all of the chocolate two weeks before I got to Mauritius. And still, get this one, still I'd lost 18 kilos body weight. So it's a great diet as well. Lots of chocolate and an ocean. So all a very self-contained little unit, me and, me and dippers. Um, and all the while with sort of the boat building and preparations, I'm training and trying to get big and strong and do lots of endurance events, which leads us back to that phrase, oh. toenails hurt more. This was after the London Marathon. Um, my toenails didn't really enjoy that experience. And um, the reason for doing these big endurance events was obviously the, the preparation. Yes, physically you need to need to be pretty, pretty strong with it. But it was more the mental strength. I'd seen my dad suffer this horrid pain in the arthritis and realized it's life is a mental game. It's having the strength and the, the motivation just to keep plodding with it. So I thought if I can put my body through, you know, through its paces, take it to places it's really not that excited about going, then I can do anything. And certainly sort of going down my grief road um, through my finals year, I just thought the ocean cannot be as bad as this. You know, I, I can do anything. So, um, toenails hurt more. That was a nice little phrase written onto the front of my cabin to keep me going out there. And that, that's pretty much the preparation for the story. Done. Now we set out to sea. And um, as the principal said, I've got quite a lot of energy and I, I sort of talk the talk a bit. And so I don't really know what my friends were thinking when I said, I'm going to row across the ocean in two years' time. You know, you big yourself up for a couple of years. And then somehow you get there and actually you're in Australia. Everybody else is at home. My weatherman was out in Australia and uh, all the palms are really, all the, all the Aussies, sorry, are really excited that this airhead palm is out, out to go and become shark bait. And suddenly it becomes a little bit daunting actually. It's a very big horizon out from Fremantle. And so it was with sort of a mixture of anticipation, excitement, nerves, and sheer bloody terror that I started getting ready to push out to sea. And, and this was the day, March the 13th, 2009. I'd had 40 minutes sleep, pulled a bit of an all-nighter the night before, trying to pack up the boat. And uh, heading out, the sun shining, all is good. I was happy to be away and on my adventure. Found the sun cream. Gets to about 40 degrees at the back end of an Aussie winter. And so um, happy, to, happy to have found all the, the necessary bits in the boat. And then on day two, the weather changed. And this happened. So I'm just going to talk you through the map. We start at Perth, top right. And the green line, which shoots off to the left of your screen, goes to Mauritius. That's the racing line. <laughs> And uh, the yellow line is my track. I head off anti-clockwise, going up. And I get to the peak of that little loop, and uh, it's end of day two, it's all looking pretty good. Now then, there's a current which runs north to south down that west coast of Australia. It's the Lewin Current. That's pretty feisty. Basically takes things very quickly towards Antarctica. And we reckoned I'd need four days of good weather to get across it and out to sea. And it didn't really happen like that. Top of the loop, the wind changed direction and started blowing this way. 
pushing me back towards Australia. So with a combination of big winds and big seas pushing me this way, the current pulling me this way, you can see that my loop goes south, west, south, 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 whew, very quickly, we're at number six on the clock, and it's not looking too good. My mum's not very happy, and Australia said to me, Sarah, you're going a bit too far south here, mate, why don't you just turn around and come back in? So I did, and <laughs> that's why the yellow line goes all the way back to Perth, it's because I just turned around and, and headed, headed back to shore. And so 10 days after that nice, pretty, smiley picture, I was back at base facing off the Australian customs. And um, I decided actually, yes, it was a failed attempt, but uh, it was more of a warm-up lap, really. It doesn't matter if you fail sometimes. You just put a different slant on it and uh, take away some lessons, and it's, it's all good. So uh, the warm-up lap, <laughs> chapter one. I set out again on April the 1st, which made for a nice little picture to the Australian press. And I had loads of people writing into the website saying, Sarah, are you sure you've calculated the sort of specific amount of fuel that you'll need? And what about the danger of fire and the weight? How are you going to carry all that extra weight? Of course, it was just an April Fool. And um, when I got back from the ocean, I had to explain to a German interviewer, Hans, I think he was called, that. Um, uh, I, I didn't take an outboard motor with me, actually. It was just an April Fool. And it was almost as tricky as, as rowing the ocean as, as telling him about the April Fool. But April the 1st, packed up with chocolate again, and uh, having fended off all the naysayers that thought I really was going to become shark bait, I set out, and all was good. Just imagine being in a tiny boat, toot cell, and you've got a 360-degree horizon and it changes through the daytime. You get the sun coming up in the morning, the sea state will change, the clouds will change, and you get a just beautiful array of colors through the evening and sunset. Different clouds give different colors, and then the moon might rise. I don't think I ever realized the moon rised, but it does. And um, then the stars come out, and they're just beautiful. And being there completely by yourself, you just feel like you're sort of a child of the universe so close to it all, and in that tiny boat, but you're sort of in this massive expanse, and it's my bit of the ocean. It's just beautiful. And I became very happy out at sea, and uh, really rather enjoyed living for the moment and just enjoying everything for what it was. It's great that there's no deadlines on the ocean. Nobody asks you to do two essays a week and uh, you don't have to go racing down to your department to hand it in five minutes before, before cut-off. Just a really simple, beautiful existence. I found it really hard coming back after the ocean into sort of the trappings of the real world, um, where there's so much clutter and stuff, and people want you to fill up the diary, and your bank manager wants you to sign something off, and all these things. Out on the ocean, my two big decisions of the day were just, um, you know, three Mars bars or six for breakfast. <laughs> which is the smelliest pair of shorts. Just such a simple way of living. And my two maxims for the day were just row and stay happy. So I pretty much just row, eat, sleep, and all these things. And from time to time, you need to go overboard. An ocean rowing boat goes slowly enough without uh, barnacles slowing it down. So I'd um, pop on the goggles and get the 99p ice scraper from Wilco's and jump overboard and scrape off these little barnacles. And it's really quite scary the first time you do that. I thought that I was a bit brave and, you know, I'd jump in and it would be fine. But it's quite funny, the first time I went in, I'd put on my goggles, I'd tied on, I'd stripped off, I'd got the camera ready, I'm going to go swimming, this is exciting. And I just sort of stood on the edge of the boat like this, ready to go, but bottled it. <laughs> I just stood there and stood there looking down. It's beautiful and blue and it's really hot, so you should just go into the water. But I just stood there waiting for it. And um, eventually the boat had sort of tipped over so much that I actually just sort of fell into the water rather sort of ungracefully. And um, I looked down, saw a little fish looking up at me, just kind of went, ah, and <laughs> jumped straight back out again. <laughs> so the first time round, it didn't really go very well. But every time thereafter, actually, it's beautiful just being able to sort of uh, swim and not have any weight. Um, on any of, any of your sore and tired muscles. And um, I think, yep, the next slide is, is my friends, the Tweedles. They're not sharks, they're little pilot fish, about six inches long, um, named after Tweedledum and Tweedledee. 
And uh, there was about 20, 30 of them actually, and they followed me the whole way across, this way, this way, wake up in the morning, hello Tweedles, and um, they became my friends. We had players such as the veritable Monsieur Tweedle Le Grand, and he was this big, he was the daddy. So I was never lonely out at sea. Lots of people say, how did you cope with the loneliness? But actually, never lonely at all. I knew I was going to be out there, I was quite happy with that. Um, and certainly you're visited by wildlife, I had my little escort of, of fish. Um, birds pop by every, every so often, so many birds out at sea. And sometimes I might be rowing along sort of of an evening and you've got the beautiful sun setting and you're just thinking about your dinner and all of a sudden I'd hear a and see a black back arching beside the boat and you start doing the calculations and it's a whale! And my little six metre boat is dwarfed as a 20 metre whale surfs underneath the boat. And you're thinking, this is brilliant! but also I hope he doesn't fancy my boat, otherwise that's going to get a bit messy. Just really beautiful. My degree was biology, so, and with a big ocean slant to it, where I could. Um, so really happy sort of being Dr. Doolittle out there and, and speaking to anything that popped by to say hello, really. Note to self, must take a plankton net next time. I should have had one of those. Now then the first part of the trip, as you can see from the chart, went really rather well. The lines are all going in a pretty, pretty straight fashion towards Mauritius. It's all, it's all good. Every five days I'd cross off this little chart, um, my, my position. And between day 40 and 45, I was sort of surfing along. In five days I'd covered 255 miles, which is knocking up 50 miles a day. So that's pretty, pretty good. And I thought to myself, well, this is, this is quite cool. Just a bit of extrapolation here. I could be at the halfway line in five days. I could be in Mauritius for my birthday. That's quite exciting. And anyway, it took me more like 45 days to get there because um, the weather changed and the ocean is both a beautiful but also a fickle and volatile sort of place. There's currents that do funny things. The wind can whip up in an instant, and if it's not going in the right way, then in a rowing boat, um, it's, it's quite tricky to go exactly where you want to go. And one day, I had a message on my satellite phone. Very nifty bit of kit. Forget mobile. Satellite phones are much more exciting. Um, my weatherman sent me messages every sort of day or couple of days, telling me what the weather was going to be like, what I could expect, perhaps where I should be pointing my boat, that sort of thing. And um, sadly, there were no more messages of you'll be surfing on sort of red carpet weather for a few days because this one arrived. Sarah, there's a storm coming and it will munch you in its fangs. I don't know what you'd think if you received a message like that. But I was freaked out by myself, the middle of the ocean. And I know that I'm about to be battered by a big storm. And when you're being battered by a big storm, quite often it's not very safe to row outside. And particularly if it's about to blow you backwards, then you're going to spend a lot of time just sitting inside your cabin. It's probably a metre high, a metre and a half wide. You can't stand up. Um, there's not much else to say about it, really. It's quite a, quite a tiny, boring little place. Um, you spend a lot of time cooped up in there, fearing for your life, hoping that the rushing, hissing, crashing waves aren't going to tip you over, and uh, just hoping that it's, it's going to end rather shortly. And it was really a very demoralising time at moments to spend a whole day rowing, perhaps spend 12 or 13 hours rowing, knowing full well that that evening the weather's going to change and you're going to be sent backwards towards Australia. And you might spend sort of a couple of days going this way in the right direction and four days going back this way. Maybe you'll get another six hours in which you can row this way and you're still no closer to Mauritius. It was a huge mind game out there, trying to keep focus through all of those, those times. And uh, I feel I should introduce you to another member of the team at this point. Uh, it's Bob, the sea anchor. Bob is a 12-foot parachute that goes outside the front of the boat on a long line. And so when you are being blown backwards towards Australia, um, I could push out Bob and he would sort of hold me into the waves and slow me down a little bit. Um, sometimes I'd still go back 20 miles in a, in a night with Bob out. And in my blog, I referred to Bob quite a lot, you know, out with Bob tonight on the sea anchor. And so my friend Hans, 
My friend Hans, the German interviewer, um, again was convinced there was another person on the boat. <laughs> no, it's just me. I just name inanimate objects. <laughs> Quite a funny one. So Bob was very important um, during this time. Uh, I had to sort of think of other ways of, of looking at it, such as, well, perhaps you're having a rest today, Sarah, if you're not rowing in the right direction. But it's a big, big mind game at that point. Trying to keep sort of mind and body together was um, a real, real struggle at times, actually, during those middle days, particularly. Because after about 20 days into the trip, I think, I sort of wake up in the morning and my hands would be clawed like this, just, you know, as though they're over the oars. You'd spend 20 minutes or so pulling them back into position. And you'd wake up in the middle of the night really feeling like you'd already rowed an ocean. So trying to, to keep that going and also keep my motivation up um, was, was tricky. Especially when this happens. This is a little printout of part of my track during those middle, middle phases. And I'll just talk you through it. We come into the, um, into the screen on the right-hand side here. And I spend a whole few days going around in a circle. Here, I'm trying to row north just to sort of um, minimize the backwards drift. I spend a whole week being blown backwards at this point. And if you ever need to know anything about 89 degrees east, I'm your girl. Because I've gone across it, I've been blown back this way, and I've rowed across it once again. And the top of the map's looking pretty good, all in the right direction. I drop down about 200 miles, just because the weather's changed again, and I go around in another circle on the sea anchor and uh, head off that way. So that's my very own bit of ocean knitting. And uh, there were lots of bits like that out in the middle. Uh, I know friends and family on my website were a little bit confused as to what I was doing. You know, did I want to get to Mauritius? <laughs> I had to convince them that actually I was trying my hardest. Just uh, it doesn't always doesn't always do what you want it to do out there. As I was saying, that mind-body thing was, was a tricky one. Um, I'm not going to show you a picture of my bottom, but uh, just imagine everything rotting. You know, feet, hands, legs, everything. When you're in salt water for that many hours a day, um, it's, it's not, not pretty. And this one just looks really gory, but actually it wasn't so bad. But I just put that one up there to scare you. So through all of these crazy times, where the boat's going in the wrong direction, uh, I'm tired, quite scared often, and bits of my body sort of falling apart, um, I decided the only thing that I could really control was my attitude. I couldn't control the weather, so there's no point getting too frustrated about it. It's a very hard thing to do. But um, I, I sort of made lists of good things about today. And so t one day it might be, thank God today is over. We don't want another one like that. But it really sort of prioritised, well, I'm OK and the boat's OK, so that's all good. And then I'd look for other happy things as well. So perhaps day 56, it was my birthday. The Easter bunny had packed me some eggs at, on Easter day, and uh, maybe I'd found you know, a big stash of Mars bars. And given the fact that I'd eaten them all before I got to the end, you can tell that when I find a stash of Mars bars, I don't sort of cleverly think like a squirrel, ooh, I'll save those for later. It's, I'll have six Mars bars for lunch, thank you. <laughs> So they were always good things about the day. And my wildlife moments were definitely up there as kind of number one with stars attached. Brilliant. And this guy here, if you look in a bird book, you'll find he's a yellow-nosed, um, Indian yellow-nosed albatross. But actually, you see them for real, and you realize they're not birds at all. They're planes, because they're huge. The biggest that I saw was a wandering albatross at three and a half meters. Now then, if I had an oar and held the oar up for you, that would be three meters. If I put my, my wings out, it's a meter and a half. And so we double that, and our friend the albatross is this big. And they only appear when the wind is strong enough for them to get enough lift, because they're really heavy, big birds. And so they appear when the weather's really quite rough, which is generally when I'm having a rubbish time. So firstly, that's great, because I get to see something beautiful. But as they sort of cruise past me like this, looking at me eye to eye, I'd just be thinking, He's taking the mick. <laughs> He's actually taking the mick. So if you ever see an albatross, it's definitely up there as number one on your list of good things about today. Happy days when there's albatrosses about. It was quite exciting, too, because I went to the RSPB before I went away and said, so what am I going to see? Albatrosses? Hoping. 
And they said, oh, you might see one or two, because I was going quite far north, and there's better wind further south. Um, but I actually clocked 16 in total. So i um, really, really excited. Perfect bit of serendipity. Now you can tell who wrote this, can't you? It's my friend Ricardo again, the weatherman. And it was on day 86 when he wrote me this message. Sarah, it's about to get very interesting. And I said, what do you mean, buddy? He'd sent me a message previously before a storm saying, Sarah, it's OK. You're a very brave woman. <laughs> and I just thought, what on earth does he mean? I need to know details. And he said, well, there's two weather systems rumbling about beneath you, coming up from Antarctica, and they're going to collide. And you're right in the middle. Sometimes this is all right. It means that everything's cancelled out, and it's sort of billiard board calm. It's really beautiful. But this time, he said, it's going to be big, and it's going to be messy, and you need to be prepared. So I rode as much as I could, and I was doing an interview that evening with Radcliffe and McConey on Radio 2. And they said, Sarah, how's it going out there? Big waves? I said, yep, big waves are coming. Are you scared? I said, a little bit scared. Have you ever capsized? No, nope, we've never capsized, and I don't think we're going to. Oh, should not have jinxed myself. Because the next morning, I woke up, and I was inside my cabin, and I could hear that things were quite rough outside. And I looked outside, and I thought, well, they're very big waves. I don't like the look of this. And they were the sort of waves that you get to the top of them, and you sort of feel a bit sick because you're so high. I mean, we're talking sort of the size of a church at this point, you know, four or five stories high of a building. And they're the sort of waves that you get to the bottom of them, and you look up, and you just sort of go, ah! <laughs> how scared I was. <laughs> Terrified. I just didn't really know what to do. And I thought, well, I've sort of got two options here. I could sit inside and be very scared all day, and if we go over, I'm going to hit my head and that's going to hurt. Or I could go outside and just have a little go. I could go and face off the monsters. And so I thought by going outside, actually, I'd be sort of in control of the situation a bit, and it might feel better somehow. And so I did. And I went outside and I started rowing. And all I could think of was just one stroke at a time. There's no space for anything else in your head because you're terrified. One stroke at a time. Just trying to keep the boat safe. And the waves are coming from all sides and they're big and they crash on the boat sometimes and you're soaked and you're still very scared. And it got to lunchtime when I thought, I'm ready for a bit of lunch now, let's stop this. And I stepped down to empty the footwell. Because the waves had been crashing, the, the footwell was just full of water. So I'm down here, emptying it out like this. And all of a sudden, a big wave slammed us from the side. And normally, it would sort of wobble. And you'd think, oh, that was close. But this time, the next thing I knew was that I was in the salt wash, under the boat, surfing down a wave. It's white, yet it's somehow dark. Salt's going into every part of your body. You're hoping your lungs will hold out. They start to burn, and you can feel the water kind of heading in. And you're just thinking, well, am I going to drown? Is my head going to get knocked on something? And I knock myself out. Perhaps my arm's going to be ripped off. And please, let's hope that this design really does self-right. Really, really frightening time. And I popped back round. The boat came back round and sort of registered where I was. And I was hanging over the side of the boat on my lifeline. Now, this is the most important bit of kit on my boat, sort of second only to the Mars bars, really. Um, and it, it goes round your waist, like so, and clips in. And this bit clips back onto the boat. So for a solo rower, it really is your only lifeline. Clips onto the boat, and I came round, hanging off over the side, over those bars, and looking up and seeing these waves crashing towards me kind of going, you need to get back on the boat fast, otherwise it's going to happen again and it might get messier. So I tried climbing back on, but I actually found that I couldn't because it was caught around the gate, a bit where the oar goes. And so I was literally hanging off the side and pinned to the side of the boat. And so the only thing I could do was to undo the line. Not a good sound. Jumped back on the boat very quickly. And I was all right. I was shaken. I'm going to show you a bit of video afterwards and you'll see just how shaken I was. But um, the boat had popped 
background. And the only thing that I'd broken was an apparently unbreakable set of oars, which this company had sold them to me and said, we've never had a set break on the ocean, Sarah. So mostly all was good. And I had to get back inside the cabin to do, um, to do an interview with Australia. And actually, it was already scheduled and I had to do it. And I thought, I really don't want to get inside the cabin, actually. Made myself, did this interview. Inside my cabin, I then thought, really don't want to get outside of the cabin now. And I sort of thought, well, Sarah, you're not going to get anywhere near Mauritius unless you get back out there and just have another little go. So I did. And I also sent Ricardo a message saying, yes, it did get very interesting. <laughs> no more of that, thank you. So capsize, day 87. Not a good day. So who's been, who's been bumped right outside our boathouse before? Hmm. It's not over till it's over, is it? Have to race through the line. Certainly lots of people on my website as I was getting sort of 60, 70 percent of the way through were saying, Sarah, you've done it. Great. Brilliant. You're there. Psychologically, that's not a place that I could be in until I was sort of safe and dry. I didn't consider that I would, um, you know, the journey would be over for me until I was actually landed on the jetty and, and having, having a hug. And so to keep pushing on, pushing on, pushing on the whole time, trying to work out just how much I could push myself, you know, and still have reserves for the end was quite a tricky one. Um, getting excited about heading in towards Mauritius, the end of the journey, but uh, very mindful of the fact that landing would actually be as tricky as getting away from the coast safely. So this here is, is a ship on the horizon, and I'm pretty happy because I've just had a chat with him. Now then, little boat and big boats don't make a very good combination, and it's very hard for the big boats to see me, particularly when sometimes they're just not looking at all. I'd spent many a night out at sea, uh, very worried that I was in imminent danger of, of becoming sort of fish food. So this is the second ship that I spoke to on the entire trip. It was about day 118, as I'm nearly, nearly at the island. And it was day 16 that I'd last spoken to a ship and actually had a response. And I'd woken up in the morning and heard my radar reflector beeping a lot. Beep, beep, beep. And it means there's a ship in the area. It's being hit by another boat's radar. And so I got on the radio and said, this is where I am, don't squash me, don't squash me, don't squash me. And there was nothing there, so I thought, ah, I'll just have another little snooze, shall I? I went back in and I lay down for five or ten minutes or so and woke up to find the radar alarm going beep, 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 really going for it. So I went back outside and had another look and actually there was a ship this time. There was a sort of 15,000 tonnes of container ship coming right for me. And he was probably about a mile away and these things travel at 50 miles an hour. So it's not very long before I was about to be squashed. And so I'm on the radio still saying, this is where I am, don't squash me, don't squash me. And sort of looking at the trajectory, thinking, am I going to just bounce off his bow wave? What's going to happen here? And so I was really excited when um, the radio crackled back with a, with a reply. And it went something like this. Small boat, small boat, small boat. This is Prince of the Netherlands. Do you require assistance? Or are you just one of those mad adventurers? <laughs> <laughs> Happy days when you have a chat like that in the morning. And he did divert his course very quickly. So the final run into Mauritius, I saw more ships. So pretty scary, but it's you know, just more signs that, that land is, is about to be over the, over the horizon. You see clouds, different types of clouds forming over the islands around. Different birds are coming in. Turns are heading out in the morning to feed and back again in the evening. And unfortunately, there's more rubbish as well. I saw probably a piece of litter for every day that I was out at sea. And considering I'm in a tiny boat, very restricted field of view, it's a lot of rubbish out there. Not a good, not a good situation. But it was all telling me that Mauritius was indeed about to happen. And this is day 124, the last day of the voyage. And so my little brother, Matthew, he's looking out to sea for me. He's looking out across the big white waves for my small white boat. Not a, not a good scenario. And it was quite exciting that they were even there because my final few days into Mauritius were going really quickly. I was being hoofed along by lots of, lots of feisty wind. And so mum had actually had to change their flights 
And I thought, uh, it's not really, very, uh, not really very good if I arrive before she does. You know, she doesn't get the first hug. So it was exciting that they were there, and everyone was excited that I was about to land. Now, Mauritius is surrounded by a coral reef. Coral reefs and boats don't make a very good pair. And coral reefs and a sort of steep continental shelf make for very steep waves. Steep waves, small boat, really aren't a good, aren't a good scenario. And so the idea was that a, an escort boat would come out and guide me in the last sort of five or ten miles of the journey. But it didn't really happen like that. I took a call from Ricardo in the morning to say, Sarah, the support boat isn't allowed outside the reef. You've got to do this by yourself. And I said, all right, that's okay. How big are the waves where you are? And he said, one, two meters high. Bit scary, but you'll be okay. And I was sort of thinking, this guy needs a maths lesson. Where I am, the waves are five, six meters high. You know, they're huge and they're very steep. So I was really rather scared. And this next slide shows that I had very good reason to be scared. I'll just talk you through it. The blue channel through the middle is the safe passage through the reef. And the mouth of the reef, is, or the reef entrance, is about half a mile wide. So it's kind of eye of a needle in a haystack rather than needle in a haystack. It's quite tiny. And the idea was that I would head up through that, that, um, that nice clear patch. The red line shows you where I actually headed. And I got to the south of the reef entrance, which is where I, told, I was told to be, and discovered that actually there was nothing I could do to get up into the safe bit of water. The waves were very steep, probably as, 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 as high as the roof of, of this room here if not a bit taller, and they were crashing, they were surfing. I mean, the way they glass over and they sort of roll over like that is, is beautiful. The water's so shallow, they're turquoise, the light's coming through. So the one hand, I was thinking, wow, what a beautiful picture. On the other hand, very big other hand, sort of 90% of my brain was just screaming, I'm going to die. I'm actually going to die. And I've never felt quite so close to being obliterated as I did at that moment. Um, as the boat was just thrown like a ragdoll, really. I don't know if you've ever seen the brilliant bit of footage in the Blue Planet series of the killer whales boshing seal pups in the surf, just kind of throwing these things in the surf. And you know that the seal pups got no chance. It's sort of how I felt at that point, as the boat was rolled and surfed. And so again, I'm thinking, am I going to drown? Am I going to get smashed on the reef? bits of my body going to be sort of pulled apart. Maybe there's a shark, just not knowing what was going to happen. And again, hoping that my lungs would hold out. And there's another part of you thinking, how ironic, how cruelly ironic. My mum is just around the corner, doesn't know where I am, and I've survived 4,000 miles, yet here I am about to become fish food on the reef, right at the last moment. So I had two more capsizes. For the third capsize, I just thought, really rather die inside the cabin than out. You know, then at least they'll know where my body is. And so I was jumping into the cabin as I was hit by the third and final wave. And so it actually flooded the cabin and means that the self-writing capability just has kind of gone like that. So the way I ended up on the reef, I actually had to heave the boat round to where I wanted it to be, sort of the right way up, because I thought upside down in a boat on a reef was slightly worse than at least being the right way up. And um, then I had to go back sort of getting myself off the reef. First of all, I thought, oh, I went to Oxford, I can punt, that's all right. <laughs> but the reef had just kind of crumbled beneath her and so it actually sunk into it. I was in sort of thigh deep water at this point. And then I had this great idea that I might be able to swim across to where I needed to be because I thought, oh, it's just over there, you know, it's so close, 30 meters from where I sort of, the, the entrance where I should have gone in and then I you know thankfully realized that's not a good idea to go swimming off by yourself and so um, I went for the the mayday call mayday 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 nobody answered that's very sobering realization that nobody can hear you we did the EPIRB the emergency beacon there were planes flying over the above over above me so I thought someone's going to pick it up I tried the satellite phone it didn't work I didn't know where the spare was we'd been thrown so violently that actually everything in the cabin was just where it shouldn't have been and so I went for the fireworks in the end. I thought, flares, people must see flares. So I don't know if you've ever used one of these in sort of sail training or anything. It's quite exciting when you do, because you rip it off and you, ah, it 
it's really cool. You do it for real, and it's such a different story. The flare goes up into the air, and you're just willing it to burn longer and longer. Because by this time, it was dark, and so I was in pitch black. And set off a couple of, couple of flares and saw a response coming back. One, two, three, help is on its way. Well, great, this is good. And then I saw, well, I, sorry, I just thought, what if it's a tree kind of doing this in front of the lights on the shore? What if I'm not being rescued tonight? And so it was a very anxious hour before I got picked up. First of all, there was a helicopter chucking out of the airport like this. And then it went that way, the other direction. <laughs> Who else is being rescued tonight? <laughs> and it came back and circled over the top of me and went this way. And I just thought, oh, it's being driven by a 12 year old, clearly. <laughs> and it came back and was over above me. And light was coming down, a bit like Monty Python. I stood there with my arms in the air going, yep, I want to be rescued. And the winch came down and just swung in front of my face. Thankfully, I'd done my sea survival course. I knew that you don't touch the winch until it's been in the water. Otherwise, you get zapped with electric shock because of the static that it collects. So another cruel irony. You're my only get out of jail free card, but if I touch that, you're going to electrocute me. <laughs> what do I do? So I just stood there for a bit longer like this. And thankfully, Ricardo appeared with a team of Mauritians, and they helped me sort of lift and shove and move dippers off the reef and into the clear water on the other side. And I was taken back to the jetty where everybody was waiting. Now, they said that 20 people were on the jetty. That was about 200 when I got there. So hence the rabbit in the headlight sort of look. <laughs> I'm excited to be alive. That was number one on the list. Happy to have made it. But also there were these feelings inside of, of nerves, anticipation of, of what lay ahead. And I was really rather sad to be stepping off into, you know, into the real world again. I'd made a home for myself out on the waves and had been really perfectly happy out there. And so for it all to be finishing was actually quite an emotional event, as was the hug. Still a bit surprised that mum isn't sort of clipping me around the ear for having worried her so much, but it's a very special hug you have after all that time. And I swear my dad was looking over us as well at that point. <laughs> Everybody wants to know what my first meal was. And uh, somebody handed me a pizza as I stepped off the boat. So I did sort of what any self-respecting ocean rower would do. I stepped forward for the pizza, but I didn't have any land legs. So actually, I just fell backwards, you know, nearly back into the, back into the water. And uh, it took me probably a few weeks before my legs had got used to walking again. And certainly the first three days, I had to have someone going up the stairs behind me just in case I fell over. We're coming towards the very end now, and uh, just finish sort of uh, the pictures with um, this rather cheesy picture of, of me at the other end, well and truly grounded on the beach. And for me, it just sums up that actually it was more about, it was more than just adventures. It was about more than just the journey out there. It was the fact that I'd survived three years since dad had died, which had been the craziest challenge I'd ever faced at that point. And to date, we've raised over 30,000 pounds for the arthritis charity. So that's my favorite triumph. Just a little tiny bit about the fallout from the ocean. This is that unbreakable ore. It's ash and carbon fiber and Kevlar. So some of the strongest materials that we've got, but yes, I managed to break them. Um, this here is my ensign looking proudly battered. I can see through it. It was shiny when I left. And um, it just really shows, I think, that we're not made to be out on the ocean at all. It's the albatrosses and the whales that are supremely adapted to life out there. I didn't conquer any ocean. Some people talk about conquering these things. I was just allowed to, allowed to pass through safely. And physically, even though sort of Boat and Sarah had, you know, we'd been through the salt wash a bit, um, actually it was the psychological fallout which took longer to come to terms with. I think it was probably four and a half months before I'd felt really settled um, back on land. I know certainly within a week of being back, I'd signed up to a round the world yacht race. You know, who does that without thinking about it? So <laughs> it's taken me a little while just to, to calm down and um, get my head around things again. And this is my favorite slide of all. The green line links the kangaroos to the rum punch. 
sort of the racing line, the rum line, the theoretical route that you'd take if you had a choice. And it's 3,100 miles, that route. And the squiggly, wiggly, wiggly bit over the top is the rower's line. And it's 4,180 miles. And so it just shows that actually wherever you're going in life, whatever challenges you face and whatever mountains you, you want to climb or you have to climb, perhaps you don't even want to climb them, that if you never give up, you keep on going and just believe in yourself and take enough chocolate, then um, <laughs> it's amazing what you can do. Amazing what you can do. And so it was this slide that inspired this very, very final slide, which is my next challenge. London to London via the world. And so it's a, a Sarah-powered circumnavigation of the globe uh, by rowboat, bike and canoe. I'm going to be rowing the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans and cycling and canoeing everything in between. And um, it's going to take me two and a half to three years setting out next year. So that's, that's the next project. <laughs> and I'm finished. And that's the closest I've been to a ship for 118 days. Cargo ship, cargo ship, cargo ship. This is rowing boat Serendipity, Serendipity, Serendipity. Yeah, this is not a tanker, this is regal. Go ahead. Wide berth requested, as I am small and limited in my ability to maneuver. Oh, that was a big wave. We've just capsized. Uh, the seas are big and the wind's from the wrong direction, so I was trying to row across them. It went right over and I was underneath the water and just kind of go, please come back around, please come back around. And she did really quickly. Although it seemed like forever because, uh, you know, you're trying to hold your breath and you're worried about getting hit and stuff and you're just trying to hold on. And oh, goodness me. So now we know what it's like to capsize. I think it's going to be a hot day. Check this bad boy out. We were very, very close to hitting each other. I've just hacked away at the lid. Um, that was a bit of an effort, getting the old Leatherman, which had rusted up, because I don't have a tin opener on board. And we're 445 miles from Mauritius, and over 2,700 from Perth. So we're nailing this baby. I'm soaked! It's windy, the waves are big and wild, but it's so exciting! I'm rowing in my mask because I couldn't see. Day 56 and I'm 24 years old. 2.4 decades. Very excited. Oh, happy days. It's quite bouncy on there. We're getting pushed about quite a bit. Okay, I'm in. 